Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I'm happy to introduce myself. I'm Carrie Kerjack. I'm the project director of the Diverse Books for All Coalition, housed here at First Book. And I'm excited to welcome everyone to our webinar series. This is webinar part one, unveiling and contributing to the landscape of diverse books for young children. Um, and this is put on with, in collaboration with this Diverse Books for All Coalition and Raising a Reader. The Diverse Books for All Coalition is a national consortium of more than 40 different nonprofits and membership organizations that work in all 50 states. And we're all coming together to try to increase access to affordable, high quality children's books that are by and about diverse races, cultures, identities, and abilities. We do this through a couple of different methods. We're doing this through collective book purchasing. We're doing this around messaging. We're partnering with parents and here today we're partnering with educators and early childhood professionals that are in the field doing this work every day with families. The work around diverse books has really never been more important. Um, as we've seen in the context that we're in today, there's been a number of reports out recently looking at the literacy challenges that um, the children are facing all across the country. And we're also seeing that diverse books have never been more important from some reports out of EdTrust recently, out of New America, and out of First Book's latest diverse books impact study that I'm happy to share a link to. So we're excited to bring these resources to you today. And we've got an incredible panel lined up here um, that I'm excited to be able to kick off. And I will start that by introducing Michelle Siusen Hyman, who is um, raising a reader, uh, who's leading this charge here as raising a reader, um, acting as the co-chair in the uh, educator and early childhood professional supports work group that we have. And so I'm happy to pass it over to Michelle. Thanks, Carrie. Of course, I was on mute. So on behalf of Raising a Reader, I just want to thank the Diverse Books for All co co Coalition. It has really been an honor to be part of such a collaborative and passionate group of folks who are committed to ensuring that all children and families have access to diverse books, which has really been core to Raising a Reader's mission since our founding 24 years ago. So at Raising a Reader, we believe that early literacy and family engagement is cornerstone to creating equity for all, which means for us, diverse books are a true necessity. They are powerful tools for celebrating identity, fostering belonging, and exposing new ideas and experiences, all of which are crucial to igniting the love of reading, learning, and ultimately later school and life success. So diverse books help Raising Reader contribute to creating an equitable, inclusive world where every voice is valued and every story is told, which is why I'm thrilled to be honored to welcome you all to today's session. So before we dive into today's, ses today's session, which is the first in a three-part webinar series called Pages of Inclusion, celebrating the need for diverse books in early learning spaces, I would be remiss if I did not specifically express my thanks um, to the Educator and Early Childhood Professional Committee who provided valuable in input into today's session. And now just a few housekeeping items. Next slide. So for um, the session, if you guys didn't know, is being recorded. And those of you who register will all receive the recording, even folks that were not able to attend today. Closed captioning is enabled for those of you who might need that. And then please put your questions in the Q&A section instead of the chat section. It'll just help us keep track of the questions. And you can uh, put your questions in all along the way. Um, and so now what I'll do is provide a high level overview of what you can expect today. Next slide. Um, so for today's agenda, it really kicks off, kicks off with a grounding of uh, grounding with the research on representation of books and educational materials. And then we will hear perspectives from an author, educator, and publisher of how this current landscape of diverse books affects them in each of their roles. The panel will be followed by the joy of an author read aloud, and then we will learn some practical tips and ideas of how to build our own diverse book collection. All right, so now onto the heart of today's session. I am thrilled to introduce Lisa Guernsey, Senior Fellow and Strategic Advisor at New America, who will then introduce Amanda Latasha Armstrong, Postdoctoral Scholar at Digital Promise. 
Lisa and I have known each other for about eight years now, maybe even more. Um, but every single time I talk to her, I am inspired by the thoughtfulness she brings to her research and the creativity in her work, no matter the topic. So I am thrilled that she was able to join us here today. Lisa, take it away. Oh, thank, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I, I want to start by just saying a big congratulations to Raising a Reader and the Diverse Books for All Coalition for pulling together this whole webinar series. I mean, across um, all the, the different uh, webinars that you've you've pulled together, there's so much rich content to come. So um, I'm excited to be a participant and a, and a listener as well. But I'm also just excited to to be able to kick kick this off and also to be able to introduce my my colleague Amanda and her work. But I'm going to take us through just a couple of slides to kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about. So if we can go to the next slide, I know that for this group, um, I don't need to tell you how um, important books are <laughs> and what the power of stories can do for our young readers. Um, really cannot be overstated. Research studies continue to show um, and illuminate why book reading in, is helping to stimulate minds, build listening, speaking, reading, and writing skills for our, for our young kids. Um, and we know from cognitive science, from neuroscience, from science of human development and early literacy, that stories have real power um, for engagement, comprehension, vocabulary development, sparking dialogic reading. So if we go to the next slide, one of the things that we have done at New America over the years is looked at what it means to present materials to young children um, in, in media of all kinds. And there's a framework that I've used for many years called the three C's, um, a framework for making smart media choices um, based on what we know from that science that I was just describing. And that is to look really closely at the content, to understand the context in which you're, you're putting books and other media in front of children. And of course, to understand the needs of the individual child at that child's age and stage of development. If you go to that, yeah, the next slide shows that really what we mean here, we're talking about media of all kinds, but absolutely books are part of this, this research base. Um, so on the next slide, I'll, I'm just pointing out that over the years, we've provided worksheets and materials to educators and caregivers and parents, as well as to policymakers to help translate that science. And, and what we are going to focus on um, today is on one of these three C's, content. Um, and on the, on the next slide, you'll see kind of what I mean by this. There's lots of ways to think about that content that's showing up for our young children. But today we're really going to understand and think about representation. Who is on the page? What do the characters mean to the child who's listening to the story or reading along um, and, or maybe reading on their own, reading the story on their own. And the picture in front of you here is of the little, a little, a book from a California library, The Little Mermaid. And I just want to point out that this is a Little Mermaid book that is not your basic, your classic quote Disney version of Little Mermaid with the white skin and the red hair. Um, and as you go to the next slide, you'll see I got this particular image from Michael 3TS, who is this Instagram influencer, at this incredible children's librarian who I highly encourage everyone everyone to go and follow on Instagram. Um, and he, um, or they provide all sorts of great um, materials uh, for educators and parents to think about when it comes to choosing really cool uh, books and materials for our for our kids. And as he points out in this particular screenshot, um, he found in his library that there are so many books with black mermaids, right? It's those kinds of moments that can matter so much to, to our kids. So if you go to the, the next slide, one of the things I wanted to just point out is that at, at New America, we're trying to better understand this space where we've been looking at culturally responsive education. Sometimes it's culturally responsive and sustaining education. Sometimes it's described in different words as including inclusive education, but we are trying to understand what the research base is for this. What do we know works for young children and for children of all ages, honestly, all the way up the, um, the age span to 12th grade. And then also how to um, implement and, and kind of execute on this. What, what does this mean in the classroom and in home? So I'll put this link in the, in the chat if you want to look at some more of these materials, but this is what some of the, some of the pieces that we've been doing and collections of materials we've developed over the years. And if you go to the next slide, we um, are, are just really trying to kind of 
bring out what the competencies might be for our, our child care providers, our early educators, um, our, our teachers at all grade levels that, the, that they'll need to be developing when they're putting materials in front of, of, of kids to help them learn. Um, the next slide will show, zoom us in a little bit on this one particular piece of this, um, this concept of these competencies. And that is that today's caregivers and educators really should be drawing on students' culture to shape curriculum and instruction. Um, and so where do we do that? We, we do that by looking for books that can help us um, really provide that for, for our kids. But as we go to the next slide, um, we we recognize that we are in a very we're in a very challenging time. It's not easy in today's climate to do this um, for a whole host of reasons that we will not go into in this particular webinar. But I do want to just point out that at New America next week, we're going to dive into some of those issues in an event called "From Book Bans to Inclusive Education." Um, it's open to all. It'll be online streaming as well as in person in DC. So I'll, I'll send you guys some more info on that too. Um, but the next slide will show you a quote from some some of the latest research about why why the fact that this is not easy should be worrying to us, but also should motivate us to really help and support children. So some new um, research from RAND based on surveys of teachers across the country um, show what the, the chilling effect um, may be of, of today's climate. And so I just want to quickly read you this quote from their study, teachers in that in that study perceived that limitations placed on how they can address race and gender related topics negatively affected their working conditions. And those teachers worried about the limitations, um, what it meant, what the consequences were for student learning. So that's something that Amanda's gonna get into um, in, in her presentation. I can go to the next slide. I'm gonna kick it off to, to introduce Amanda and, and her work, is, which has been so important to us at New America. Um, we really need to be paying attention to the data on who is represented in the materials that our that our kids and our students are seeing, how how they're being portrayed, and how that that portrayal or representation affects learning. Amanda came to us at New America um, more than three years ago as a research fellow, and um, had been doing dissertation work on this on this topic. And we were so excited about that work. We grabbed her and we said, "Please help us." Um, translate this as well for um, broader audiences. Um, so I'm just really thrilled to call Amanda a colleague. Um, her work is really quite um, eye-opening and very helpful. Um, Amanda's now at Digital Promise, so we're sorry to lose her, but we um, remain very um, connected. And this presentation is an example of that. So Amanda, I'm going to turn it over to you now. And thanks so much for this. Great. Thank you, um, Lisa, for the introductions, and I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for raising a reader and diverse books for all coalition for assembling this group of folks. So I'm going to continue the conversation that um, Lisa started about representation. First, adding context that, um, again, I am at Digital Promise as a postdoctoral scholar with the Learning Sciences Exchange. And before then, as Lisa said, I was with the New America team. And as you can tell, we still will stay connected forever, probably. Um, so again, going back to this report, so um, Lisa pointed out to like some of the different points of that report, which are first, um, a lot of a lot of the first part of that report is really about making that connection about culturally responsive materials and student learning, which she uh, focused on. I'm going to really talk about the second part, which is really about the frequency of portrayals of racial, ethnic, and gender groups. And I think there's also the report and there's also additional materials related to that report. So there's also a policy brief as well as a research brief that has a lot of the visuals that I'll be um, speaking to and sharing during this presentation, as well as there's um, a blog post when we convened a group of, of developers of educational materials to talk about what developers can do. So those are some additional materials to refer to. I do want to talk about, uh, before we get into the material, about how I oriented the, the research report. And so I was def greatly influenced by Black feminist theory. And so Black feminist theory centers on the lived experiences of Black women to be able to look at different systems, to look at different ways in which 
um, their lived experience is impacted by different oppressions and different sorts of conditions. And so within the context of this research report, I use Black feminists to inform it in a few different ways. So one was through self-definition. So within Black feminist theory, they talk about self-definition as a way of speaking of oneself and crafting one's agenda. And within the context of this research report, I wanted to make sure that we included practitioners and scholars who belong to the diverse community. So definitely checking out and, and reading their um, bios and their background, and then stating and getting their input to state what is needed about representing those communities. So really having making sure that there are folks who represent those communities who are giving feedback. Another part of Black feminist uh, theory is they refer to a lot to the controlling images, which is kind of like these images that are reproduced by schools and media to about certain kinds of images, particularly of Black women. And so, and then also identifying what are those sites of resistance to those controlling images. In the context of the research report, I wanted to make sure to identify a range of portrayals of, of different racial, ethnic, and gender groups that are presented within educational materials. Another point is having everyday knowledge and expertise and specialists really combined together to create actions for moving forward. But then the context of this uh, research report, um, I want to make sure that we included the practitioner publications, academic articles and dissertations to lead to action actionable steps. And then within that, being able to identify what was noticed, what folks recommended, were there any overlaps and similarity, were there distinctive differences, and trying to really get kind of that comprehensive understanding within the literature and what folks were saying to be able to create takeaways that resonated with that. So I'm going to be very high level um, for those research for the research report itself. I definitely there are more details, so you can refer to that. Um, so just high level from a frequency of racial, ethnic, and gender representation. There was one study that looked at uh, uh, Koss and Pasiga that looked at representation within children's books. And so with this visual, I, I compared it to the U.S. Census. So in the report, we see that there is a overrepresentation of of white Americans within um, within that particular study of, of uh, children's books. But then when we look at Black, African American, and Asian, there is that discrepancy between um, what's portrayed and then the demographics. And so we notice for some, even like for Hispanic Americans, that there is there are more within the US demographics than there are within um, within what's actually portrayed and who is actually portrayed. And this is was created before the undercount, which we know also occurs within the census. So there's that disparity within uh, books and that resonated with multiple studies as well, or was consistent with multiple studies as well. There was also the frequency of different gender groups. And so there was a study that was done of, of books in like the late 60s in which really looked at by uh, uh, male and female uh, representation. And we noticed that there are folks who, researchers who reproduce or did a similar kind of methodology. And so we got more uh, balance within uh, the binary perspective of, of representation, but then it never quite got to 50. And so again, noticing that it was common for gender to present it in binary perspective, that there are rare depictions of non-binary gender uh, characters throughout of the, the uh, books. And also that when we looked at female and non-binary characters, it was they were more likely to be white and for BIPOC characters, they were more likely to be male. We came to racial ethnic portrayals, like who's actually presented. One way that it was looked at was through the actual theming. And so there was a one study that looked at particular themes related to groups and who was presented. And so we see with culturally specific experiences, there was, Kind of like a consistency or evenness around amongst some groups, but then when we come to uh, themes of oppression um, or even everyday situations, there are those uh, dis disparities between different racial and cultural groups. And then the other part was that each racial ethnic group tended to have um, portrayals that were like narrow and problematic or promising and positive. But then they were also, there were some features that were particularly unique to the racial and ethnic group, which is presented in a table, um, but it's also explained a little bit more into the 
in the research report, but from a high level, there were three things that were seemed to be common amongst the racial and ethnic portrayals. So one, narrow and problematic portrayals were common that usually that could be like, there was more a main reference to one particular aspect of a racial ethnic group. It could be a tribal group or a subculture, which was mean to represent the whole group, or they may be presented as problematic, whether it's lacking intelligence or warlike behavior. There also were instances where they noted there were positive and promising depictions. So there was either the use of a language that was actually used within context, or the characters were dealing with contemporary issues and wearing modern clothing and living everyday experiences, which in some cases, some racial ethnic groups were presented, particularly in one specific point in time. And so promising and positive portrayals really see, uh, portrayed folks as contemporary. And there was also inaccurate and misleading and incomplete information. So that could be something as minimal mention of a particular racial ethnic group within historical events, or maybe inaccurate presentation of different customs and traditions and religions. For gender portrayals, for individual identities. So for female characters, there were some instances where it, they were passive or dependent. And then there were others that countered those earlier depictions in which characters were active and having a career. For non-binary characters, there was a consistency of the lack of diverse group representation and the contributions of those different groups to different fields. And then some cases within the story, their identity was, was the centering of the story and it was problematic for other folks. And then there was a resolution at the end. For intersectional identity, so there were also some limited portrayals or traditional portrayals that were related to either uh, those of the specific racial ethnic group or the gender group itself. And then there were some that depictions that were affirming and positive, and in some cases, those weren't culturally authentic. And I think it's also important to note that we have to think about the more contemporary research that we were noticing before. So um, the Cooperative Children's Book Center recently published the work of the 2002, and so we still notice that white characters were common and that um, characters of other racial ethnic groups weren't presented as often as primary characters. And then when we look at disability and LGBT uh, representation, there's minimal of that, as well as the Ed Trust report, which also demonstrates, again, kind of the problematic instances of representation that there are in, in children's books um, and, and grade books, but there's ways of moving forward. So then the, the, the um, research report ends with three different ideas of what the three different takeaways could be. So one, is creating a sense of belonging. So as we know all this information, really try and select materials and create ex educational experiences that have a fuller uh, story of the United States and different people and demographics and they interweave in American history. This, the second one is really developing cultural authenticity. So evaluating what characters do and their activities and the creator's ability to authentic, authentically represent those complex depictions. And then also recognizing nuanced identity that we think about that story and characters, as Lisa said, are important and that they support students in identifying relating to different careers, disciplines and hobbies. Another thing to also consider with books is that it's within the ecosystem of children's media experiences. So we think about what they see with camera or them taking their own photos on laptops, books and such. And so when we think about just like their whole ecosystem, we're thinking about how we're, who's represented and how. And so whether we look at research that's come from the Gina Davis Institute, uh, looking at gender and films and television or common sense media's work and representation and, and looking at different forms in YouTube, we know that there's a commonality of the disparity of social group representation that exists in different forms of children's media. We also want to think about that books are traditional forms of media are presented in different forms. So in software, in, in television, in apps. And so really also thinking about, well, what does the research say there when we're looking at these newer forms of media? So I'll point to two research studies. So there's one study that looked at 38 app protagonists, um, and the, which were the central characters. And there were some interesting things they found, a similar kind of pattern. So they noticed that when they looked at race, um, a third of the characters were white, 
a third were animals, um, and then the rest of the third were split between creatures, black um, characters, and outliers. When they looked at gender, over half were male. And then when we looked, when they also looked at able body and, and able bodiness, they noticed that a majority of the characters were able bodied. And then in my own dissertation research, I looked at physical traits of preschool apps. And so this was over 100 apps, which equaled about 329 characters. And then I looked at main and secondary. So about 218 main and about 11, a little over 11. Um, hundred or a little over a hundred secondary. And some, some interesting also certain kinds of trends also emerged from that. So there's about half of them were animals and then about 30% were human. And then the rest were human-like or other spe species or mechanical. So again, going to that over um, that often that's that larger population of animal characters. And then I looked at specific traits related to racial, ethnic, and gender groups. So one of those traits was skin tone. And so within that, for not for a for uh, main characters, about 63% had white skin tone and then the rest had non-white. And non-white means like shades of brown as well as black uh, skin tone. And then for secondary characters, um, even more about 70% had white skin tone and the rest had were non-white, had non-white skin tone. And so when thinking about just the media landscape itself and that disparity and the consistency of different forms, I do turn to different, um, to turn to different scholars. So one of them is Cynthia Dillard's work in Indarkin Feminist Theory. And really what she helps me do is think about the idea of time. And so thinking about moving forward, um, thinking about what they've done like before us and also being in the present. So we're thinking about time and thinking about all these different influences in which I can learn from or learn with or be inspired by those who've came before being present or those who are future to come. The other part about Indarkin feminism that, that helps center me is I began to reflect on how my imagining um, or, or engaging with my own cultural memories with being um, identifying as a black woman, engaging in those cultural memories and leading me to respond to like ourselves, the world, interactions with folks to be more humane, humane and with greater responsibility. And so when I reflect on that, I'm inspired to think about a few different ways of creating space, creating educational spaces or creating educational media or creating um, research that kind of helps me think through different ways of doing things. So sometimes it's about creating counter spaces, cultivating criticality and context creating time for care and community to take kind of a break and pull back from that for nurturing personhood, both myself as well as peers, as well as the children that I work with. And then also providing opportunities for creativity and agency. And with that, I want us to kind of close with another point from Leo's work that really helps me kind of also center myself. So as I move forward, I, and maybe even just as a call for us to even, as we move forward in the work, is to really think about making each encounter with ideas, each class we teach, each research study we undertake, that it's imbued with the possibility of creation, of making something new and different an outcome that may create something even better and more just than what already exists. And so with that, I wanna say thank you um, both for myself and from Lisa, our, our social media information is there. And so I will stop sharing my screen from there. Thank you so much. Oh, Michelle, are you muted? Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Need to remember to unmute. So thank you so much for that powerful information. It really helps us build the case for why, um, for the work that we do and the work that we're doing as part of the Diverse Books for All Coalition. Um, just a reminder for folks, if you have questions for Lisa and Amanda, if you could put them in the Q&A box, what we'll do is after the panel, we'll invite Lisa and Amanda to come join the panel at the end, and then we'll have a Q&A session with everybody. So, But if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A uh, box now, and, and we'll be taking a look at those when the, when the panel's done. 
So with that, um, I'd like to uh, invite our panel speakers and moderator to turn on their cameras. And they will be sharing with us today how the current landscape affects them and their roles as publishers, authors, and educators. Our moderator today is Susan Friedman, who's the Senior Director of Publishing and Content Development at NAUIC, and is the co-chair of the Educator and Early Childhood Professional Di Diverse Books for All Coalition Committee with me. Um, Susan is going to be joined by our amazing panelists who will do a more formal intro of themselves during the panel, but I'm just excited to um, have Karen Chan, who is author and founder of Glue Books Publishing, and both Jenny Torres Sanchez and Lindsay Birkins are authors and educators. And so, as I said, the panels provide more information on who they are during the session. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and I'm so excited to be here with you today and to be able to have this conversation. Um, I just wanted to start out by asking each of you to share more about a little bit about who you are and why d diverse books are so important to you. And I'm just gonna, um, the order that you are on my screen is Jenny, Lindsay and Karen, so you can go in that order. Sure, hi, um, thank you for having me. I'm so honored to be here today and to be able to share this time and this space and be in community with all of you. Um, so my name is Jenny Torres Sanchez and I am an author. Um, I write mostly for young adults, um, but I do have a picture book for the little ones as well. Um, and all of my books really kind of deal with real life issues and difficult topics. Um, I think it's really important to be honest with our young people and to be able to engage in honest conversations. Um, so that's what I try to do on the page um, with the older kids and with the little ones. Um, I found that as an educator, you know, young people don't have a problem talking about how complicated, how complex our world can be. Um, it makes a lot of adults uncomfortable. And it's unfortunate that so many children, you know, kind of are dictated um, what they can read and what they can't read. Um, so I really am glad to be here and be discussing all of this with all of you. Thank you for that. And Lindsay, um, what about you? Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today. My name is Lindsay Birkins, and I have been an educator for a little over 20 years. And so, and an early childhood educator. So I've, I've taught between first grade and I'm currently teaching third grade right now. And I'll say to you that every single day, I walk into the classroom, I get to see the joy that students bring to books, their lived experiences, their questions, their, their excitement to think about what the author has to tell them. And I also will tell you that, again, just like Jenny said, kids are not afraid to ask questions and to think about race, gender, religion. Um, and, and, and so they're constantly questioning. And so I've been really excited um, to get to spend the last 20 years negotiating um, the world with children. And they always bring to the forefront love and humility. And I show that back to them. So I'm happy to be here to share some of the insights I've had 20, year, 20 years in experiencing reading books with kids. Thank you so much. And Karen? Thanks, Susan. Um, thank you again for having me. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Karen Chan, um, and I'm the founder of Blue Books. Um, we're a new-ish um, indie children's book publishing company, um, and our motto is that we make books for a more inclusive, just, and compassionate future. Um, I come from not a publishing background uh, in terms of, you know, being in the industry. I come as an outsider. And I think like many of people here today, um, I'm a parent uh, of kids and I was really dismayed at the lack of diverse books available for kids. Um, and as I started kind of going down the path of looking at this issue further, not only for kind of creating a library for my own children, um, I really saw how there was a lack of diversity within the publishing industry that was creating these books, right? So um, I basically wrote a kid's book because I thought, well, there needs to be one out there that has a main character that looks like my son in it. And that was really hard to find. Um, but it really didn't, for me, that was only, you know, one step in a larger kind of um, uh process that could really help change the landscape of, of publishing and the content that kids were are, are reading. Um, and so I formed Glue Books as an opportunity and a platform for 
underrepresented authors and storytellers to be able to get their stories out there that might not otherwise have the chance to do so. So we formed Glue Books and um, yeah, we're publishing diverse and inclusive children's books. Um, and I think like what um, Lindsay and Jenny said, kids are ready um, and they're very willing. I think um, we underestimate what their um, appetite and curios for curiosity is about the world. Um, that's beyond just sort of like cars and animals, right? Um, talking about culture and um, issues that are going on in the world. And so those are all really central to what Glue Books does. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and it's great to be here with you again today. Um, the next question has to do both with the research base uh, that um, the, the landscape that Lisa and Amanda presented on, and also um, Carrie shared some research in the links, and I know we haven't had a chance to go through it yet, but I also know that some of you are familiar with this, that um, children feel a sense, their children's ability to learn is impacted by their sense of how much they feel a sense of belonging, purpose, and agency. And um, I failed to introduce myself, I know um, Michelle did, but um, I work, I'm Susan Friedman and I work for the National Association for the Education of Young Children. And I'm one of the editors on our book on developmentally appropriate practice, which really is centered on how this theme of uh, feeling a sense of belonging impacts learning. So as you think about the um, research landscape that Lisa and Amanda presented on and um, what, are children's books that are diverse available and also what they mean in terms of um, children feeling a sense of belonging and being able to learn? Like, how do you think about that in your role that you play? Lindsay? I had to make sure I unmuted. <laughs> so Kurt, right now, I just, we're finishing up, I'm co-authoring co a book with Frankie Siberson for NCTE that really talks about building a classroom library building a library where kids can come in and be agent to and see themselves in the classroom library that we that we cultivate for them and a lot of times educators don't have the freedom to buy books and put them in their classroom library. And so one of the things that we talk about is how can we use a larger library system to then bring books into our classroom, but as we're doing that looking across um, the lived experiences that we see that our kids have and how can we create spaces where kids can see themselves in books with joy, kids can see themselves with books that teach their their loved history, um, kids can see themselves in books that are incidental, where you know the story has kids in there that look like them, but their identities aren't the problem to be overcome in that story. And so one of the things we truly think about is, what does our classroom library look like? Does it look better than the statistics and representation that the publishing um, has offered us? Can we find every great book about kids of all lived experiences, especially the ones that are marginalized in our classroom? How do we build that up? And how do we use systems, the library system or um, grant systems to help build a robust, a robust library for our students? And so one of the things that we found is having that robust classroom library is very supportive, but also looking at the books that we use for instruction. Um, are those also representational? It, oh, of course it is a challenge because we look at the publishing industry and what we have is not enough. But if we can find every good book out there and flood our libraries with those, we're off to a good start. And so that's the constant goal. You know, how are we looking for books as educators and sharing books with each other and then putting them into our classroom spaces? Um, well, I'm thrilled that you mentioned instruction. I think sometimes that gets um, people to, I mean, obviously books are great for stories, but I do think they connect to a lot of learning areas. Um, so that's that's music to my ears. Um, Jenny? Um, yeah, so I write, most of my books deal with children who feel like outsiders, um, who feel alone, who feel like they are on the outskirts of society, on the fringes of society, um, because there are a lot of children who feel that way. And it's important for me for them to feel included and for them to feel seen and for them to not feel alone. Um, I think, you know, uh, when children don't see themselves on the page, when they don't see themselves as part of society and they don't see themselves accepted as part of society, uh, that's incredibly damaging. And what we do when we say, you know, when we start banning books, when we start taking uh, books off of the shelves, 
we're telling children, you, your family, your culture um, needs to be banned, needs to be censored, is dangerous. And I don't think any of us want to send that message to children um, or to young people. And so I think, you know, it just speaks volumes to how important it is to have diverse titles out there um, and have children really be able to see themselves and celebrate themselves and, um, you know, feel validated in in what they're reading in our libraries and on the shelves. Um, I also think it's really important for them to see uh, a diverse group of creators. Um, you know, I'll share with you that in fourth grade is really probably where when my love for reading was really developed by teachers who did Miss Macaluso was this wonderful teacher who read um you know the latest and greatest and so at the end of class every day she'd read to us for about 10 minutes and we went through all the Ramona books um and we went through all of the Judy Bloom books and I absolutely loved being read to um, so much that I fell in love with story and thought, oh, I'd really love to do this one day. I think I'd love to be a writer one day. Um, we didn't have author visits back in the day, <laughs> but also the um, authors that we were reading didn't have my name. Uh, you know, it was Beverly Cleary and Judy Bloom, who are fantastic, but it would have meant the world to me to hear an author that had a last name like Torres. Um, so I think it's really important for, for children also to, you know, be, be shown that they can be the creators of these books and that they can be the artists and that they can, you know, they can do these things. So it doesn't remain this kind of elusive dream that they don't know how to reach. Thank you for sharing that. And Karen, um, what is your perspective um, on the research that Amanda and Lisa presented and how does that connect to your role and what you're doing? Yeah, um, I mean, I think echoing what has already been said is, you know, diverse books are so important um, to have kids feel seen and have their experience, experiences feel validated. Um, and just like what Jenny said, like, you know, people of color can be authors too. They can be storytellers. They can have their books. They can be authors that are going to schools and doing uh, readings and stuff like that. Um, probably experiences that we did not have as kids um, ourselves. And so, you know, that motto of if you can see it, you can be it is really, really, really resonates with me and is sort of a strong tenant in sort of um, what we do. And I think on both sides of the feeling seen aspect of feeling seeing yourself in depicted in in picture books or books in general um, and media is really, really important. Um, and then on the flip side of that, I think the one thing as a publisher that I feel like I'm constantly trying to sort of preach or kind of get people to accept is that diverse books are not just for, you know, that specific demographic or group, you know, um, it's so important for kids to I think at that this early age, especially that we're talking about, um, you know, their world is crafted entirely by what we sort of present to them, right? Whether it's in the classroom, the home. Um, and if we're only choosing uh, material or content that looks like them, that's great on the one hand, but it doesn't give them the opportunity to get curious about someone that doesn't look like them, that doesn't have a shared lived experience as them. And so it it comes up in my work quite a bit where we're always trying to say, you know, yes, uh, for example, this, you know, book series might be, um, about you know Asian cuisine, for example, but it's not just for Asian kids. Um, it can be for everyone, and we really try to do that also within the like art direction and depiction and illustrations, where we're saying this is not just um, you know books that are for Asian kids, um, and it's only Asian children, Asian culture that's being depicted. It's really for everybody, and I think that gives people an opportunity. Um, frankly, adults too, you know, a learning opportunity to find something that they've never um, known about before and get them really curious and talking with um, their kids um, about what is this new, you know, food or culture that we might be looking at. And I'm speaking specifically about the series on, on food that we have. Um, and so it's sort of both sides of the equation that uh, I feel like are really important um, to kind of convince other people and, and get them to see the value of getting diverse books in their in their um, classroom that they might not relate to. But then on the other hand, making sure that the kids that are in their classroom or at their home um, feel seen um, and represented. So I'm gonna just switch the order now and um, 
start with you, Karen, because you basically answered um, the next question, um, I think, which is how do you decide what's diverse or authentic? And you described, you know, looking at the children in the classroom, but also offering them um, windows into other um, cultures and other experiences. And you mentioned the book about food. And I thought um, you're the only one of these panelists who had the opportunity to speak to you beforehand. So I heard this story, but um, you had a really um, great story about how you heard a teacher using um, one of the books that you published in the classroom. And I'm wondering if you could just share that, because I think that does provide a little insight into thinking about diversity and also a story from a teacher. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's always great getting feedback from educators on how they're using our books in the classroom and extended learning and stuff. And this actually happened to be just um, an incident at lunchtime. Um, Susan, the um, incident you're referring to, but a teacher told us that they were, you know, sitting down to lunch and they had a student who brought their lunch from home and he had naan um, for lunch. And the teacher made a comment like, wow, I love naan. It's so delicious. And he quickly corrected her to say, no, it's pizza. It's it's not naan. Um, kind of sensing a, a sense of sort of embarrassment that he didn't want to bring something, um, you know, that's different to school. And so um, our first book, um, th which is the that we published, which is the one I wrote called What's That, is um, around food shaming and lunch shaming, uh, but really about feeling empowered and um, proud of your culture and your heritage. And in that book, the main character is a Chinese American, um, but they ended up, uh, the teacher ended up sharing it with the classroom and they all read it. Um, and it started this great conversation with people from all different, or kids from all different backgrounds sharing, this is the food that I eat and this is how we cook. And it's, uh, you know, these are the dishes that my mom makes that I love to eat. Um, and it gave them the opportunity to really speak about their own heritage, their own culture, where they come from. And it was a really beautiful, um, it just, it was a really beautiful teaching lesson that um, this teacher was able to create from a moment of embarrassment and sort of shame from, from a student. Thanks for um, sharing that story with the group here. And um, Lindsay, I know um, you're in the classroom, I think. And can you just share a little bit about um, how you think of diversity and how that connects to um, a story about using a book in a classroom, either from you or one that you've heard from another educator? Absolutely. I think whenever I, I think about using books, and we, and we think about diverse books, I always have to talk about the shoulders who I stand on. So Dr. Rudine, Rudine Sims Bishop, you know, wrote a beautiful piece, Mirrors, Windows, Windows and Sliding Glass Doors. And that I feel like when I was in graduate school and learned about her piece and started to think about her words where they, she talks about kids need mirrors and they need windows and those sliding glass doors where they can both see themselves reflected, but then look into a new experience. Every day I seek that for kids, right? And so even today, we were reading a new book um, that just recently was published by a good friend of mine, um, Gary Gray Jr. and illustrated by Oge Mora. And it's called I'm From. And we spent time after lunch today. We always gather in our meeting space and um, we projected on our large, our board and we spent time going through this book. And this book is about this little boy who talks about all the things he's from. And it's kind of reminiscent of that Georgia L. Lyons poem, I'm from. And my kids were pouring over Oge Mora's illustration, but Gary Gray's words, as he was talking about cultural artifacts from his life. And the kids were shouting out like, oh, I like that. And oh, I love how we called it cotton candy hair for our Afros. And they were just connecting in ways that I stood back and just listened to and started to chart because it was really powerful to see them connect with his words. There was also a part where there's a two page spread and Gary writes that sometimes, you know, there are things that hurt him. And one of the parts was sometimes he was, he's been called, he doesn't talk black enough. And the kids stood up and they're like, what does that mean? You know, and they wanted to have conversations and there's other kids in the class were like, what is, yeah, what does that mean in another way? Like some of the black kids were like, who would say you don't talk black enough? But then there, I had other kids saying, what, what would that even mean? And so the opportunities to negotiate conversations about 
who we are, where we come from, things in our lives that may sting or things that we hear on um, those microaggressions or parts of us that we're really joyful about. We sat and had that space to do that today, right after lunch on a normal Thursday, but that's what books bring to us. And so when I think about diverse books, um, it's always hard because we think about the global majority are people who have been marginalized in the publishing industry. And so when we say diverse, it's really, I, I got this, I got some of my thinking from Chad Everett's piece about what does diverse books really mean? And he talks a lot about diverse from whom. And so setting the standard, when I say diverse books, I'm talking about not diverse or, 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 or people that, um, you know, like, if we're thinking about marginalization, diversity means when I think about diverse books and publishing, the books that aren't published often are people from the global majority. And so um, the standard in publishing aren't people who have been minoritized. And so that is when I think about diversity and, and the authenticity part of that is are we having um, books told by authors that that's their lived experience. That's the life that they represent and they're telling their story. And a lot of times um, you can tell and by students' reactions that they connect more when the author has come from that lived experience. They engage more, they're raising their hand a lot. And so I really think that those two pieces, having books that represent the global majority and having books written by people who have lived that experience has caused um, lots of joy in my classroom and conversations that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, it's just, you know, so great to hear about conversations around books like this and um, your the perspective of the authenticity of the author, um, you know, really children, res children understanding that they're not necessarily going to engage in a conversation around something that's kind of too superficial. There's not enough meat there. And that's, um, that's really something that's missing, especially with people um, putting forth that books, certain books should not be in the classroom. It sort of just stops all conversation about it. They're just not in the classroom versus talking about why they're there. Um, Jenny, you had um, mentioned the importance of um, seeing authors or wishing that you had had the opportunity to have authors who had na last names similar to yours when you were being read stories by your teacher. And I'm just curious, what you what is your perspective? What do you think about when you think of diverse books? What does diverse mean and authentic mean? And also, what are things that you've heard from teachers in your conversations about your books? Um, thank you. So when I think of diverse books, I think of all of, you know, the the culture and all these new worlds that I can learn about. And I don't see how, you know, how that can be so um that can make so many people feel insecure. I think it's beautiful to learn about other uh, cultures. I think it's beautiful to learn other languages. I think it's beautiful to hear other languages and see other people's lived experiences. Um, so it's really difficult for me to really wrap my head around people not wanting that. And at the same time, seeing that that's, that's very much the case um, and it's being you know kept for, from so many children. Um, but as far as like, what I the how I include diversity or how I write diverse characters into my books um, really kind of goes back to what Lindsay was saying. I just kind of write what I know, what my lived experience is, what I know growing up in my community and how it um, functions and and you know how we are. Um, and so when I see that resonate with readers, it's really amazing to me. I just went to. Well, I will say this first is that um, I, I love books that celebrate our differences and that celebrate our different cultures. And really, you know, we see that in books. But I also love that at the same time, those books are showing us how we're not all very different at all, because children, you know, they all like will really respond to those books. Uh, my book with lots of love it does deal with a young girl from Central America who misses her grandmother who lives across borders and they can't see each other. Um, but every child who has ever missed someone 
that book resonates with them. And so, you know, it, it just, uh, I just think that that's what, at the end of the day, that's what we see in books. We celebrate our differences and we celebrate our similarities. Um, and that's what diverse books means to me and what, what I think it brings to young readers. Um, when I went to uh, an elementary school uh, just a few days ago and was able to read to um, a group of kindergartners, <laughs> They were so beautiful. It's such a wonderful experience to read to little to, to kids. Um, but you know, a lot of their population is um ELL speaks, you know, speaks mostly Spanish. And when they were coming in and I was saying, Good morning, good morning, buenos dias, como están. When children heard me say those words, and they were like, Oh my gosh, there was their eyes were wide open and they were just kind of like <gasps> you're like, I feel included in just a little bit of language like that. So you can imagine the impact that a book can make on a child and how they feel. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I can't celebrate enough the, the, how we should have more and more diverse books. And it angered me so much that anybody's trying to stand in the way of that. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. And that, um, you know, that's a wonderful example of, um, both, I mean, thinking of both the challenges and the opportunities, you sort of, sort of woven both those themes into that answer. And that actually is um, the last question that I have before we bring in um, Lisa and Amanda and respond to questions from the um, group. And so, um, you know, I just was curious if you wanted to add anything related to your thoughts on the both the challenges um, related to diverse books and the opportunities. Jenny, sorry. <laughs> um, I think the challenges are that, you know, so many people, there is a large um, demand and a large want for diverse, but a large desire for diverse books. Um, and so the masses want that. And we have this very small majority in power that is preventing that. So we have the powers that be that are trying to prevent children from getting these. I was so upset. I saw on you know social media just a, a little while ago, a couple of days ago, um, somebody who is you know said that they they have to opt in for diverse books at book fairs now, um, instead of it just being part of the collection, instead of it just being included. And I think it was like the third day before she got some diverse titles and some students had already um, gone and spent their money and gone to the book fair and, you know, had taken a look around. And it just makes me so sad that they were not able to, they didn't have the choice of what books they wanted to choose. Um, and, you know, the, they they were limited to what they saw on the shelves and and whether they saw themselves on the shelves or not, so. Yeah, I, I I think we just have to rally and um, take all of this information and really be motivated to put more diverse titles out there and do all that we can to champion them. And um, Karen and um, Lindsay, when you think about the challenges you've each faced in your role, um, what are those challenges and what opportunities do you see for improvement? Yeah, I'm outside of the kind of legislative landscape, which I think Jenny talked about, um, from my perspective as sort of a publisher, and we're talking just business, right? Like people buying books, selling books. Um, obviously, a huge challenge within, I think, the publishing industry is, is frankly, how there's a lack of diversity within the publishing industry. So um, from the time that the, you know, from the pages and the depiction that's on the pages to the person who's writing it, to the person who's illustrating it, editors, agents, you know, the marketing people, the PR folks, the execs, everyone along the way, the distributors, um, the book buyers, everything along the way, it's, you know, there's all these gates that are closed to people. Um, and every like step along the way, you're just trying to convince people why your books are worthy. So from my perspective, um, a lot of times multicultural books or books, books about people of color are often seen as sort of niche and, you know, the market is not big enough um, to support that. But I think, um, as we all know, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> and that's just a um, common kind of thought that I think um, 
a, a very traditional industry kind of carries is that oh, we're not we're just not going to sell a lot of um copies of this book. And I mean, even within like the movie industry, right? It's like very common to, to say that. But then you have these cases where, um, you know, we show up like, you know, um, blockbuster hits and, you know, titles that sell really well, and it's all based on the demand of it. So I think as educators, but even as consumers and what you want in your classroom and what you want in your libraries, um, the more that there's this request to have these books, the more I think publishers are going to say, hey, we need to actually include more inclusive books, more diverse books, because this is wanted, you know, so the like the more we can use our, um, you know, purchasing power or what what we want stocked in our bookshelves and our libraries and our schools. Um, the, I think that's uh, the opportunity there to kind of solve that challenge is that that the industry will respond to that. Right. So. And obviously that is kind of complicated by, you know, legislative things going on in book bans and um, even some publishers like preemptively not um, uh, uh, distributing certain books because of, they're afraid that they'll get banned. But, as, you know, outside of that, um, I, I really see that as sort of the opportunity is that continuing this conversation, continuing, you know, panels like this and educating people why uh, diverse books should just almost be the baseline standard for any kind of classroom or library um, will help the other side of the industry in saying, okay, we do need more uh, inclusive, we need to publish more inclusive books and more diverse books. Okay. And um, Lindsay, you have the closing words on this. I mean, how do you see the challenges in your role and the opportunities? So I think book bans, hands down, I mean, are extreme challenge. I, every year, multiple times a year, we have lists of books that are challenged at our school board. And um, I have had the opportunity, which I'm grateful for, to sit and talk and, and speak to a lot of the books. Um, but because of the banning and because of um, sometimes parents talk on social media about books that are read in classrooms, um, then we have that effect of soft bans. And a soft ban is when teachers are scared to use books because they're worried that their name's gonna pop up on social media or that um, somebody's going to challenge them in front of the school board. And that is a very real thing that is happening every single day in classrooms across the country. And I have the opportunity to do some um, work with, with classrooms across the country and I'm hearing this all the time. I'm hearing this in my own building. And so um, one of the things that's sad and frightening to me is that when you, have this happen, a lot of books, even though they're great, wonderful books, are not being shared. And teachers are sticking to what they are, feel are safe. And if we think about the teaching profession, much like Karen talking about the publishing profession, we have about 85% um, white women teachers in that in our profession. And so um, really, who are scared to use books, of any kid of color, any kid that, or any tiny representation of gender or um, anything that has to do with anything with ethnicity, nothing feels safe. And so we have a lot of teachers just, we all, I'm seeing, we're seeing engaging in book, soft book bans. Um, thank you for bringing up that topic. It's one that, um, I've been very concerned about, I've been thinking about a lot. And so I'm hoping um, we can do more on exploring that topic and how to support, provide information to those teachers. I mean, how do we counter that? Um, it's it's certainly a really important point and topic. So thank you so much to all of you and please stay on the screen. And um, I'm going to invite Amanda and Lisa to um, come on camera and, um, I want participants of the webinar, you can ask questions um, and put your questions into the um, chat box. And um, we're gonna ask um, questions to the different um, panelists. Let's see. So um, I did get some questions beforehand um, and we'll start with that. And we hope that you will um, add some more questions here. So 
Based on what we heard today from um, panelists with different perspectives, classroom teacher, publisher, author, um, and from um, two people focused on research, how do you see um, the recent climate of book bans impacting the field of diverse books from where you sit, um, from you know each of your perspectives? And some of you have talked about this, but I am interested in, we could start with um, hearing what Lindsay and Amanda have to say. Not, I mean, Lisa and Amanda, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in to say that there's, um, I mean, we're, we're trying, at New America, we're really trying to, to follow this, but also to recognize some distinctions across grade levels, um, certainly across different um, geographies and states so that we can get a handle, um, a, a much stronger handle on like what is going on in the context of certain communities and, and what do they need right now. Um, so there are there are some states that have, um, the, well, California and Illinois, for example, have a legislation that's on the side of like, we're going to make it hard for for schools to ban books because we we want to we want them to really have justification for what they're what they're challenging and I think that's a positive and then there's also states that have built out over many years um, standards for 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 teaching and for instructional materials that relate to what's culturally um, relevant to to children and to students and and those states already have um, some laws on the books that can help uh, educators have some backup in this. But obviously right now the the headlines and the way where where kind of the, the national discourse is moving towards instead looking at those those places in those communities where there there really is this um this fear and this chilling effect. And and sadly we have seen in some of the data points and I know um first book has been looking at this as well as Ed Trust and others that sometimes that chilling effect even moves into those places that are those states like California and Illinois um, or, and others, right? Where even educators in, in, in places um, that aren't necessarily getting those vitriolic school board meetings, um, they're still they're still getting concerned. So I think we we are um, at a at a point where we need to start um, thinking about strategies that really make sense in certain contexts and sure. and also just doing what we can to really with research back up those teachers and parents there are parents out there who want this and there's data on how much parents want this of all parents of all all colors all ethnicities all you know they 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 want diverse books for their kids but that we need to be elevating those data points so that they're not drowned out um, and I don't know, Amanda, if you have more that you might want to add to that. Yeah, I, I agree with everyone, um, what everyone's saying. I think like starting local um, and thinking about what can happen within context, what folks need. I think from a researcher standpoint, so um, me at Digital Promise, as well as a lot of folks, we um, have lived experiences as educators or some of us still do direct service kind of work. Um, I know my previous role at um, New Mexico State, I was looking at games. So it wasn't books, but it was still games, but still introducing serious games in which they talked about um, different identity groups. So I definitely have experienced the pushback um, within settings, my own experience with, with families. Um, so I think part of it is like, yes, thinking about local and then as researchers or as, as applied researchers to making sure that we're making distinct those distinct points of connection, um, as Lisa was saying, of like why this is important and so that it can be written into policy and different standards. So I think part of it is like we're at that strategy stage of how do we help support folks like and give them like the arms to be able to argue for why this is important. And I think as long as those of us who are kind of doing that kind of work also stay connected to the live where we're also putting ourselves out there too and, and kind of understanding what's happening that we can also like build those sort of connections. And so I think it's, you know, the coalition building that's happening now and then also engaging in conversations and just helping folks understand what are strategies that we can do short-term um, as well as thinking about like the alternative space, um, alternative different spaces like the work of New America talking about open educational resources 
Are there other institutions and places that can build out resources while we're also dealing with um, these banning situations? So what are alternative forms of information, alternative places of information? And then um, also thinking about what are the long-term sorts of strategies that we can implement? Okay, it's a daunting question. So thank you for those thoughts. And I do have one question that I got um, from the audience um, that I just want to pop in here, um, because we have about five minutes left to this um, part of the program. So um, the question was about how do we propose, how do you propose working with independent bookstores? And um, I don't know if any of you have particular experience um, in your roles working with independent bookstores and how and how we might answer that question. Um, you know, I know that has to do with the distribution of books into the marketplace. Does any, do any of you want to speak to that question or? Um, yeah, I mean, I I can yeah. sign in here. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, so the question is, uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? The question is really how do, how do you propose working with independent bookstores? And so, um, I think that maybe the idea is some thinking that an independent bookstore might have, um, more clout or more freedom in choosing a range of books. I mean, and you could speak to both working with independent bookstores and the distribution into like, how do you have your local chain bookstore or Barnes and Noble and have, I mean, or whatever's online on Amazon, how do you have these books pop up? Yeah. I mean, I think in general, and this is not totally completely true, but generally I think smaller um, local bookstores are more open to working with, for example, indie presses like us who, um, you know, have maybe uh, books that might not, you might not find in sort of like the big five publishers, right? So that's one aspect of it is just supporting um, indie bookstores. We love working with them. Um, they often are places where we can like host events and they have the authors come and do a reading and um, are really open to um, kind of responding to their local community. And kind of a common theme that we've heard is that I think a lot of people do want diverse books, right? We see it even within a school setting, but um, from a transactional perspective to like a commercial perspective, there are parents and families who do want diverse books. And, I, and a lot of local bookstores really understand their community best. They're um, really tied into that neighborhood and, and those, those folks who are coming into their store. And I think it's really um, a lot of times just supporting them as opposed to the big box retailers is, is often helpful. Um, and yeah, I would say like as much as you can, you know, supporting indie bookstores is, is a really good way of helping support that. Thank you. And I'm going to ask um, Lindsay this question just from the um, classroom perspective. Um, and I don't know if you have an answer. It's a hard question. The question is from the audience and says, do you, do you see any hope or possibility of working with textbook publishers for expanding what they are offering as instructional materials, or are they too restricted by state laws banning diverse content? Now, I know um, you're coming at it from a teacher perspective. I mean, I do work in publishing, and I think that there is an interest in a lot of publishing in addressing um, needs of diverse um, children, families, classrooms, teachers. And so my hope would be that while some publishers may feel restricted, others will feel that it's important. Um, just Lindsay, curious about your thoughts on that as you're working maybe from some curriculum. Yes, well, I wanna say that the one of the best things about the school district that I work in is that we don't, we don't have a reading curriculum in the way that it's a, a book and a basal reader. Like we get to we get to collect the books that we're going to use for units. And so with that comes a lot of power, but also um, supporting the teachers and understanding how to collect those books and give ideas. On the flip side of that, um, I I do know there are publishers. I was at one point writing for one who um, switched things up because they were nervous about being able to sell in some states. And so I think that that's a very real thing. And I walked away from that experience knowing that I won't participate in that situation. But I do know that there are publishers who are backing away, um, textbook curriculum publishers who are walking away from having representation in their curriculum because they're worried about selling. And as teachers, I would just say, 
if you have one of those books, you know, how can you supplement? You know, what are some of the books you can bring into the classroom that build upon the um, skills and strategies that the book the book is teaching and supplement those stories that so that you can have a repre representational piece and body of literature to teach from. Thank you so much. And we have to wrap up this portion, but I do have one little wrap up for each of you. And I'm wondering if Jenny could start. Um, what is your favorite diverse children's books that, that you book that you want to share with the um, rest of this group? That's such an unfair question because there are just so many. So I'm just going to do this really quick. Um, was that I love uh, The Bridge Home uh, by Padma Venka Trayman. Um, the Bluest Sky by Christina Diaz Gonzalez, Land of the Cranes by Aida Salazar. It's wonderful. Um, One Last Word by Nikki Grimes. It's the, all of these books are amazing. So if you can get them, um, please do. <laughs> sorry, I just got to I had to do four. I'm sorry. Okay. I had eight and I had to like, you know, bring it down a notch. So um, thank you. Those are great, great um, books. Karen. Um, we're just picking one. <laughs> so gosh, we're doing, we're doing a wrap. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, given that like school kind of just went into session, Jacqueline Woodson is one of my favorite authors. She's so great. Um, I mean, everything she writes is like pure poetry. Um, so I would say that's that's on my on my many, many top one <laughs> favorite diverse books that I would put up there. Okay, well, uh, Lindsay. Uh Karen took mine. <laughs> But there are just so many. I'm going to say, like, just because we read Gary Gray today, his new book, I'm from. Um, watching my kids' reaction to that today, brand new book that just came out. I'm going to support that. Um, but there's so many authors out there. I can't even say one, but his book, I'm from, was, is beautiful. I'm going to check that one out. And um, Amanda? I also got overwhelmed by the question as well, because there are so many. So, um, the book that I, I I really enjoy and I consistently give it as a gift um, to to children is Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut by Derek Barnes. Just the experience of going to the barber shop and and like the kids and the visuals. I mean, every time I give it, like it's always like the parents are excited that this book exists um, as well. Um, and and giving it and sharing as a recommendation for teachers. So that is the one that I'll share. But there are plenty more that I could also share. Okay, and um, Lisa, you're going to wrap this up and we're going to go to the next part because we're a little over our time. Yeah, I, I was, for me, this was um, Maya Angelou. I know why the cage bird sings. And it was, it's from my own childhood as a, as a white girl in the South. Neat, I, I was like, oh, I need, this is important. This is beautiful. And I need to read this. But it, it was later in my, in my schooling that I was exposed to that. Um, but I still go back to Maya Angelou all the time. Great. Thank you all so much. And thank you to Susan for moderating the panel. You did an amazing job just keeping the flow going and, and making sure that all voices were heard. And thank you to everyone um, for sharing for sharing during that time. So now I am really excited. Um, I was excited before, but I'm also really excited because Jenny's going to add some fun and sparkle to our event with a read aloud of her book with lots of love which has been selected as Jumpstart's Read for the Record book this year. There'll be more info about Read for the Record at the end of the session. I want to just hand it over to Jenny now. Um, so take it away, Jenny. Thank you, Michelle. And I am going to go ahead, if you will all just bear with me a moment, um, and going to share my screen so that you can follow along as I do the read aloud. And this does take a moment, so... All right, um, hopefully you can all see that now. And this is With Lots of Love, written um, by me and illustrated by Andres Yolin. And like I was saying before, um, this book is dedicated to anyone who has ever missed someone. And I also dedicated it to my youngest daughter, Francesca, mi estrellita, my little star. 
All right. So Rocio had a new home, but she really missed her other home, the little house where she used to live with Abuela, Tia Rosa, and her cousins. She missed Abuela's small grocery store where her grandmother sold fresh fruits and vegetables, pan dulce, and ice pops made of watermelon, mango, and coconut cream. Rocio used to visit Abuela's store every day. Abuela always called out, Hola, mi amor. Her voice sounded like a faraway flute. Sometimes Rocio closed her eyes and pretended she was back at Abuela's store. The smell of spicy peppers and burnt sugar danced in her nose, and Abuela's gentle voice played in her ears. She could hear, too, the soft rustling of piñatas that hung from the ceiling. Rocio missed those piñatas that Abuela made herself, how they swayed and whispered every time she walked into the store. And she missed the sweet treats made from marmalade, sweet milk, and fruit that spilled from them at celebrations. If only she had asked Abuela to make her a piñata to decorate her new room in the United States. Rocio missed many other things, too. The buñuelos drizzled with honey that Abuela made for everyone and the extra sweet coffee that Abuela made just for her. She missed Abuela's warm tortillas and the way they smelled sweet and fresh like the damp earth after a soft rain. She missed the pretty song of her language. She missed gazing at the blue-black night sprinkled with stars with Abuela at bedtime. Most of all, she missed Abuela. Rocio looked up at the nighttime sky from the window of her new house. It was full of stars, too. Rocio searched for the brightest star and made a wish. In the morning, Rocio woke to Mama, Papa, her brother, and her sister singing Las Mañanitas. Rocio smiled as they sang about the beauty of the morning she was born. Then Mama pointed to a box and said, You got a package in the mail this morning. Rocio jumped out of bed and ran to it. She recognized Abuela's crooked handwriting right away. Con mucho amor with lots of love. Inside was a dazzling star made of bright ruffled paper. Shiny streamers hung from its pointed tips. Rocio took it out and her eyes filled with tears. Beneath it, she noticed a small, smaller package, a cloth towel stitched with Rocio's name. Rocio closed her eyes and held it to her cheek. She smelled a sweet, earthy smell. Inside were tortillas, perfectly shaped by Abuela's gentle hands. Then she noticed one last gift, a picture of Abuela, Tia, and her cousins holding a banner in front of Abuela's grocery store. Feliz cumpleaños, Rocio. Rocio kissed the picture and thought of the star she had wished on last night. Abuela had plucked it from the sky and sent it to her. That night, the piñata hung above Rocio's bed. The picture sat on Rocio's nightstand, and Rocio blew Abuela a goodnight kiss. She watched as it traveled out her window, through the night sky, past so many stars, to where it landed back home, on Abuela's cheek, with lots of love. Oh, thank you, Jenny. That was beautiful. That was amazing. Okay, so, so much fun. So now um, I'd like to introduce you all to my colleague, Rebecca Crystal, who's the Managing Director of Programs and Partnerships at Raising Reader, who will share some tips and ideas of how to build your own diverse book collection. So this is a topic that she could literally spend an entire day talking to us about. So you should have seen the look she gave me when I said she had about 25 minutes. Anyway, Rebecca, it's all yours. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's been a part of this amazing webinar this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are. 
Um, I have the pleasure of sharing with you all how to build a diverse book collection. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, but I want to thank our diverse book coalition partners, such as Nacy and First Book, uh, for helping combine resources with ours to provide this information for you today. So continued resources for further exploration are going to be shared at the end of this section. And we know that this is just one sliver of many, many different types of information that have been discussed in tonight's webinar and um, that will give you for further resources. So why children's books? I've heard time and time again, but it's just children's books. What could they possibly teach throughout my career? Um, think about your earliest memory that you might have of a children's book whether it was read to you, whether it was one you purchased at a bookstore, whether it was your first discovery and your first love of books. Is it a memory that's a cherished one? Or is it one that you associate negative feelings with? But regardless of what your experience with that children's book is, we all have that memory of our very first time. Children's books are often the earliest form of media that children are exposed to and that they where they can learn about the diversity of the world around them. They really influence a child's development of their own identity. The early experiences really shape their own identity, as I mentioned, and their perceptions of the world around them. They can help children understand how society perceives themselves their culture, the cultures of their friends, their neighbors, their classmates, and so on. And they act when they accurately portray diversity in multiple languages and cultures, they can positively influence that child's self-image and help them build bridges of cultural understanding. When children see themselves in books, they feel validated. They have this positive form of self-efficacy. It helps them form connections with books on a deeper level. And as we heard so many different experiences earlier in today's webinar, I can think of one of my first experiences as a teacher in Baltimore City Schools, providing books for kiddos in the neighborhood of Westport. I can also remember my colleague Tymesha and I taking Raising Reader for the very first time into some of those same schools that I was a teacher in and for the children to open their red book bags and see themselves for maybe the very first time in the pictures of the book the delightful squeals and conversation that those books led to throughout the rest of the year for those kiddos. When we have why children's books, when we have positive representation in children's books, and I know this is a repeat from a little earlier this, this afternoon, we want to make sure it's, it's providing children with those positive role models giving them an introduction to characters with similar experiences. Oh, this person's like me. Or as I heard the one of the little girls say said when I brought Raising Reader to her classroom, oh my gosh, this looks like me. This looks like my auntie. She was saying all of the people in her neighborhood that the, that the characters in the book portrayed uh, looked like. It shared an experience, familiar experience, it shared the familiar language. It really reinforces cultural identity as well as the varied identities within groups and within cultures and helps inspire the learning of others. When kids see those, those um, windows into the worlds around them, it piques their interests and it gets them excited for more learning to come. So while diverse books can be super positive and affirming for experiences for children, the absence of children seeing themselves within print or digital can be very problematic, as we've heard earlier today. When children don't see their family, their languages, or their cultures represented, they receive a loud and clear message. They are not valued. Their family is not valued. Their culture is not valued. They simply aren't valued. So some children's books, while seemingly diverse, can also have the inaccurate and harmful depictions of cultures or groups of people. These representatives are equally harmful to children at just as omission is. We, it's sending them the wrong messages about their culture, whether their own or, with, or others. So really regardless of if we have books or if we don't, no single book is going to fully represent a group of people, a culture or a complex issue. 
What we really want to make sure is that we have multiple books providing multiple multiple perspectives of various cultures, various groups of people, and various issues. So as we think about what culturally diverse libraries are, this is just a this is just a really quick hit list of what they are. These are texts that engage children because we've all seen many books that just don't engage children, but they're talking about really important topics. Varying demographics and social identity markers, the genres and formats, the content, the lived experiences of those authors and illustrators, the opportunities for windows and mirrors, and so many more things. So let's take a look at how we select diverse children's books. So a collection should include, when we're looking at um, selecting books for our classrooms or for the groups of children that we're serving, we wanna make sure we have people that represent cultures, language, and ethnicities within that community. So children can say, oh, I see just like the little girl in my story from Baltimore City. They can say, oh, this looks like um, auntie. This looks like my teacher. This looks like the, the gentleman that works at the corner store. Books that show a variety of ways of life, maybe immigrant and refugee experiences, bicultural and multicultural experiences, and a diversity of looks, work, family life within all groups. Books that show stories and characters with and without financial resources. A book should also, children's books should also include a various um, structures that families can be found in, whether it is extended families, adoptive families, LGBTQIA plus families, single parent families, blended families, and so on. We also wanna make sure we include all characters that break gender stereotypes, that break gender role stereotypes. Books that portray children with disabilities as active, capable, main characters within a story and not just the trusty sidekick. Enabled and differently abled children from all racial and ethnic groups, genders, and classes as active participants in our stories. So think about any additional considerations that you think about when choosing books. You can feel free to put it in the chat. You can feel free to put it in the Q&A as we continue on. Um, I'll, I'll take a look at the chat as we talk about evaluating the children's books you have and as you're selecting them. So when we evaluate children's books, we're looking at several different things. And just a few of the things are, that are my go-tos when I'm looking at evaluation for children's books. I'm looking at the context. I'm looking at omission and the representation, the illustrations of the story, how they're captivating or not, the storyline, authenticity, language, and of course, I'm always looking for stereotypes and tokenism. And I'm also looking at a lot of different resources when selecting children's books because I have my own perspective and we all have our own inherent biases that we may not be aware of. So I go, I go on several different resources that I'll share with you in just a few minutes and look for reviews just to make sure that all perspectives are being considered. So considering the context, um, historically authors and illustrators identified as white middle-class artists. And they, they wrote stories from their own perspectives. What's been so great in recent years, we've seen more and more authors and illustrators that are um, writing books from a range of backgrounds. And while we've come a long way, as uh, Lisa and Amanda were telling us earlier today, we have so far to go still. So it's important that the stories that are being read are represented as authentically as possible, whether that author and illustrator has experience from the perspective the book is taking, whether they've done extensive research or whether they are the characters themselves that they're writing about. So we definitely have to make sure we're looking at the backgrounds and perspectives of our authors and illustrators. I also take a look at the copyright date and not that older stories aren't rich and beautiful and have wonderful um, stories to tell, but I typically start looking at, if I'm building my own library, I'm gonna start looking at books that might have a newer copyright date and go from there.
I'm also going to look at representation. So things like stereotypes, tokenism, omission, and authenticity. Stereotypes are really, you know, an oversimplified generalization about a particular identity group, which sometimes carries derogatory and inaccurate messages and applies them to everyone within the group. It's dehumanizing. And every one of us, especially young children, are susceptible to absorbing stereotypes and thinking that stereotype is the norm for a group of people. Stereotypes can be blatantly portrayed in a book or other media, but it can also be in the background as a soft undertone. So maybe thinking of some of those invisible stereotypes that are actually visible, maybe people with disabilities needing to overcome their disability or get cured rather than living and thriving with their disability. Maybe a uh, invisible stereotype might be women who are independent or strong. They're considered manlike or outcasts. Another invisible stereotype might be non-white characters dressing in clothes from hundreds of years ago while their white counterparts are dressed in contemporary clothing. Take a look at tokenism. And this is where the one only message, where it teaches children who is more and who is less important. So is there a part one person kind of just thrust into a group just to have that trusty sidekick? Or is he thrust into, he or she, thrust into the group just to say, okay, we checked that box off. We have, we have someone from a marginalized group. We have a child of color. Or we have a child with a disability in the book. So it, it, uh, I'm going to check that off on my list. So just as books have stereotypes and tokenism, which we know is harmful, omissions harmful as well. When we exclude stories about groups of people, we're sending that message again that ch to children that these groups don't matter. So some groups that could be invisible that we might not think about every all the time might be um, families or communities that are rural, maybe single parent families, maybe individuals from the LGBTQIA plus community. And finally, authenticity. We wanna make sure characters are shown in accurate descriptions within their cultures and their lifestyles. Something else to look for is really checking the illustrations of a story, um, looking for offensive images and accurate portrayals. And do the illustrations match the story? These are all pictures from books that I could easily find. Do characters from a certain group all look like each other? Do they have stereotypical characteristics? Are their heads or body parts enlarged or in some type of grotesque fashion that's not really anatomically correct? Again, are they dressed in... Um, dressed in ways that are from hundreds of years ago, or are they just inaccurate altogether? So definitely checking the illustrations is something to look for while you're evaluating your children's books. Then of course, checking the storyline. What's the message? How do the relationships balance between the characters in the story? Are characters from marginalized communities or groups of people always the ones to be pitied or always the ones who have to overcome a problem or, you know, having that white savior complex where the white character helps, helps the character from a marginalized group and makes everything better at the end? Are diverse characters shown in those positive leadership roles? They're capable, thriving, the heroes of the story. And is the message affirming to children from diverse backgrounds and showing children and in, in people from marginalized groups doing everyday things? So heroic things, everyday things, and every, everything in between. Some additional considerations that you might want to see is, you know, what about animals? We saw from... Um, the CBC earlier, earlier in our webinar that a lot of animals are used as characters and animals are a great way to portray messages in a story and to convey life lessons. We really wanna to get to as many types of authentic representations as possible, but also it's okay what, once in a while to have the animal and character, animal characters. So I can think of Entango Makes Three, 
is a great representation of an LGBTQIA plus family of penguins who two male penguins are raising a baby penguin together. And while that is a great representation of that particular message and acceptance, we want to make sure that's not the only perspective or example within of a library. So have Entango Makes Three and then have a different book altogether. Have Love Makes a Family, have Jacob Has Two Mommies and so on and so on. So that there's multiple perspectives from that one viewpoint. Making sure the books are age appropriate. So sometimes we have beautiful books from all over the world and beautiful translations, but oftentimes I find that the age level represent represented is a little bit higher than where that age is really appropriate for. So taking a look at that. And our beloved folk and fairy tales, while they teach really important messages and they're oftentimes stories that all of us grew up on, um, there's a lot of sexism and racism and bigotry that can be found in some folk and fairy tales. So I really, really encourage you to take a look at those stories and through the lens of sexism, through the lens of white supremacy, through the lens of uh, racism altogether and double check. And if they are, when appropriate with children, um, of older children, using them as conversation pieces, if it makes sense. So where do I start? We've heard so much rich, important information um, in our webinar today, and it can be really overwhelming. If I'm an educator in a classroom and I'm just building my library, where do I start? And how do I get all of these amazing books that we've been talking about today? My, in, my encouragement is to start where you are. Start where you are and grow your collection over time. You don't have to have every title now. You can lean on those indie book uh, indie bookstores that we talked about earlier, lean into your local libraries to help you borrow books until you can acquire them for your permanent collection. Focus on windows and mirrors. And I'm so glad it was mentioned earlier in today's webinar, um, the work of Rudin Sims Bishop. Look for the windows and mirrors for the children that you serve first. If you're going to start somewhere, let's start with our, our classroom or our groups of children that we're serving right now using books as a catalyst for conversations, and seek out books from authors and illustrators who personally identify with the book's characters and experiences. So now let's take a look at some more resources and tools that might be useful for you. Lee and Lowe Books is one of the country's largest multicultural children's book publishers, and they've done a lot of work with helping classrooms figure out where they are in their own libraries. And they've developed this classroom library questionnaire that um, I've used time and time again that really helps you take a look at the library, your book collections, and identify where gaps might be. So that could be another place that you start with taking a look at what you have and going from there. There are so many different content reviews that are just so valuable, and I won't read them all. I'm sharing just a few of my personal favorites that I go to oftentimes for different types of book reviews. If you are registered for this webinar, you will get the recording, and we can also provide a PDF copy of all of these resources. Here are some others. And then I have, so those were content reviews. And now I've got some places where my go-to websites. So social justice books, we need diverse books. The, the diverse book finder, here we read. Oh, I have diverse book finder twice. It's how much I like it. Colors of Us, Small Book Presses, and ALA's Rainbow List are just, again, just a few of my favorite places to go. And then I also go and look at children's book awards. So these are several, not all, these are several different children's book awards that I might go to um, because of the content, because of what they are celebrating and what they are awarding with children's literature. So I'd love to know what are some of your must have books we heard from the panel earlier. And I'd love to know um, what are your favorite books? Feel free to put it in the chat. And thank you so much. I am going to pass it back to my colleague, Michelle. 
Thanks, Rebecca. I told you she could probably go on for um, hours and hours. So thank you so much for uh, sharing. And please do put your uh, favorite books in the chat. And what we'll do is we'll compile the list and send that out also with the list that our panelists shared um, to everyone who registered today. So before um, we close, I just have a couple of announcements. Um, Rebecca, can you bring your slide deck back up just to have the... Um, and while she's bringing that back up, we can take a look at some of those titles that we have in there. So we've got Julian is a Mermaid, My Friends. Keep them coming. This is great. All right. So before we close, I just wanted to have an, share an announcement that this, as we've mentioned before, this is the first webinar in a series of three. So save the date for our second webinar. It's on November 2nd, and we will get um, information out to everybody who registered for this webinar about web, um, the second webinar um, shortly. And the second webinar will really focus on how can we spark conversations about identity, race, and belonging through using diverse books. So really excited. We have um, additional great speakers and panelists, and as well as some research from First Book that they'll be um, sharing as well. Second announcement, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Jenny's uh, book, uh, it is this year's Jumpstarts Read for the Record um, book, which is the world's largest shared reading experience that celebrates children's early language and social emotional development. So this year, um, the ca campaign will be held on October 26, and the selected title is Jenny's book with lots of love um, that's illustrated by Andre, and I apologize if I'm saying this incorrectly, Seolin. And the Jumpstart soft cover includes reading guides as well as event and activity guides. So all can join in the celebration of inclusive early literacy. And for those of you that are attending today, I'm really excited to share that participants and viewers will can use the discount that's on the slide here to receive a discount if you're buying um, this book in bulk, for example, in your classroom. Um, and then one last announcement is the event that Lisa shared that New America is having next week. Um, we'll put a link in the chat for that. That is happening on October 3rd. The name of that event is called From Book Bans to Inclusive Education. And after today's session, change the slide, um, we will, if you could um, complete the survey monkey, it's a Promise you it's short, it's like three minutes. Uh, it helps us know what went well, what we could have done even better, including the timing of the event as well, because we've heard that this might be a little late for some. Um, so just let us know, provide your feedback. And with that, I want to turn it over to Raising Your Readers CEO, uh, Michelle Torgerson, who will close us out for the day. Well, thanks, Michelle. This has been such a powerful two hours, just watching the chat light up. It has been nothing short of wonderful to be here with you all in community as we listened and learned together. And my extending the thanks to, I want to extend thanks to all of our speakers and panelists, Lisa and Amanda, you got us started off and were just incredible in laying out the data. Um, and all of the reasons why this issue is so important. And Susan, you're a legend in the field. It was such a treasure to have you with us here today. And Lindsay, Jenny, and Karen, thank you for being here on the panel and in conversation. And Jenny, you sharing your storybook with us and knowing that you are the Read for the Record book has been, it was such a treat to have you read your story aloud with us all here today. Our own Rebecca, I agree, Rebecca could go on for hours about the importance of how to curate an inclusive book collection. Rebecca, thank you for bringing your wisdom to this group as well. And to all of our participants, thank you for elevating this as an issue that you care about, that you wanted to learn more about, that you wanted to contribute to. It has been a great honor to have you all here. A huge thank you to Carrie and the Diverse Books for All Coalition. Raising a Reader is so proud to be part of the, of the coalition. And uh, we remain and are unwavering in our commitment to do this work in collaboration, and especially around the issue of diverse books and elevating the importance of inclusion and representation for all children and their families. And we are so honored to be here in partnership with everybody on this call today. Please do stay in touch. I 
think there were nothing short of maybe 10 different studies and links and, and resources that were shared in the chat. We'll be reaching out with a recording um, for all of you to have, and as well as there's a number of other ways for, for you to stay involved with this group. We're, we're really thrilled to be here in community with you all, and thank you all for taking the time uh, for being here together today. And with that, we will say goodbye with a few minutes to spare. Thank you.